Mission Specialist Clark, log number 1095.75, Earth Year 2531. It's, uh, it's been almost 48 hours since I got out of cryo sleep. The adaption time has been a bit longer than expected, and, and I, I feel like I've just gotten my bearings. The nausea is barely present, but my mind remains, um... It remains a bit foggy. The rest are still out cold. There's a small margin of time before the main pilot and the captain are absolutely necessary for the next step in our mission. However, the fact that they still haven't woken up from cryosleep worries me terribly. The two of them were the first of the Horizon crew that was supposed to be out of the chambers before the rest of us. Um, we have remained on a steady course to the extraplanetary object and getting even closer to the Oort cloud. The object is massive enough to be able to be seen already, but it's so dark that it's impossible to spot from any porthole yet. So I'm fully relying on our sensors to guide me. There have been a few deep scans of the cloud that the onboard AI has been performing in regular intervals. Nothing for now, I would say, is out of the ordinary or much different from what was hypothesized. The extraplanetary object is another thing altogether. As of yet, the scanners haven't been able to penetrate through the thick hull that seems to be made from an alloy that is foreign to anything we have in our database. The only thing we know for certain is its location, which is strange in itself. Um, before leaving Earth, we had presumed that it was in orbit around some kind of astronomical body that, well, it wasn't registering on our scans. Uh, nonetheless, there is no sign of anything, even now. The extraplanetary vessel th had somehow managed to come to a dead stop and remain inert at the very edge of the heliosphere uh, for the past 1,000 years. <laughs> to think that we've only discovered it 100 years ago, and when it had arrived at its present location, Galileo was still not born. Mission Specialist Clark, log number 1095.75, addendum. Um, uh, it's been a few hours now, and, uh, I have to note that the odd sound I've been hearing since I awoke has become more frequent and intense. Uh, I haven't run additional scans yet, but the internal and external readings of the horizon show the status of the areas of the vessel as nominal. <sighs> you know, I, I wonder if I'm just exaggerating a phenomenon that might actually be normal. Um, however, this is the first mission of its kind. I felt it deserved a log entry. My worries about the status of the crew in cryosleep remain. Our approach to the object is constant. Sensors are registering it as dormant. Mission Specialist Clark, log number 1096.45. Horizon nominal. Crew in cryosleep. Oh, it already feels like I've been alone on this ship for a thousand years. Even though the AI keeps telling me that it has only been a few days since I exited my cryo chamber. I don't think this AI can really feel the passage of time, <laughs> or it would have agreed with me. It also seems unfazed by that awful sound that appears in regular intervals. Is it being picked up by my mic? If I didn't know any better, I would describe it as heavy rain or thunder. Strange how the mind interprets things. Uh, and anyway, I'm preparing new parameters for a special scan of the hull, factoring in the possibility that the extraplanetary vessel might somehow be affecting the horizon. I shall wait for the additional scans of the Oort cloud to be done before I run it. The readings of the cloud have turned quite fascinating um, the closer we get to it. The more information the scans acquire on what is out there paints a much clearer picture of the universe that surrounds our tiny little planet. 
However, my understanding might be completely wrong, since it's not my area of expertise to read such scans. <laughs> my excitement for being the first human to lay eyes on the sphere that surrounds our solar system is the only thing keeping me from losing my mind to that illogical sound. <clears throat> you know, I, I can't wait for our mission astronomer to emerge from cryosleep and see the readings. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be amazed to find out that some of his theories were incorrect. Who knows what else is out there? Oh, and on that note, who knows how many more ships patrol our galaxy beyond the cloud? Going through my logs from the first few days that I was alone on the horizon is a deeply surreal experience. I don't even remember who I was back then. She, or rather past me, still didn't know and couldn't even fathom what awaits her. Needless to state the obvious, those sounds she was hearing were no normal phenomenon. And that ship... Oh, that ship. What a dreadful surprise it would turn out to be. As the next hours on the horizon went by, past me was getting more and more nervous, since there was no notification of anyone being prepared by the cryo systems to be awakened. I had inspected the chambers as best I could with my limited knowledge of cryotech, and there seemed to be nothing wrong with them. The AI assured me that all 12 of my colleagues and crewmates were perfectly fine and dandy, happily immersed in cryo dreams. However, this was the moment that I first considered finding a way to open the chambers manually if it would come to that. To my continuous frustration, I was unable to find a way around the security protocols and my AI friend wasn't willing to do me any favors. What it didn't seem to understand was that getting closer to the extraplanetary ship meant that our pilot should be awake, ready, and adjusting our course so that we don't crash into it before we could even meet our potential cosmic neighbors. Not that there was a chance they were still alive. I thought naively in that moment. Since the going assumption of mission control was that everything was possible, the captain should have already been preparing for first contact days ago. Even with me as a mission specialist on possible intercultural communication, it was she that was delegated the honor and pleasure to be Earth's ambassador in all things alien. Days passed on the horizon, that were as long as millennia. Maybe it was the isolation I felt for being the single conscious human being that had ever traveled as far into our heliosphere as to reach its fringes. Or maybe it was that damned sound that played tricks on my mind, making me feel like I was stuck in a perpetual rainy day in a mechanical palace back on Earth. Whatever the psychology behind my miserable state, I was still convinced of the reality of my surroundings. Being clear-headed was one of the characteristics that cosmonauts had to possess to be chosen for this mission. Retrospectively, I might have known exactly what to say and how to act to pass those tests back on Earth. However... I'm firm of the conviction that no one can objectively know at this point in time how anyone can react to being sent so far away from home with the presumption of making first contact. No one. I was still unable to see the extraplanetary vessel, nor could the scans pierce through its outer shell to get readings from its interior. To say that I was nervous about that would be a definite understatement. The onboard AI, my only companion, my source of information and inspiration, had alarmed me to the fact that we were, at that point, only 72 hours away from the extraplanetary vessel. And no one else was out of cryosleep still. Furthermore, it's said to me that 
if our course was not piloted properly in the next 24 hours, we would certainly, we would certainly crash, crash into the massive, into the massive spaceship. spaceship that hailed from God knows where. Surely, I thought at first, this cannot be the way the first mission to the fringes of the heliosphere ends. <laughs> <sighs> to make matters worse, our messages and logs would take ages to arrive back on Earth. And by that point, who knows if they would even care enough about space exploration to deduce what this vessel was. For all I knew, the aliens might have still been alive and waiting for us to discover them. I could only imagine how they would understand a ship hurtling toward them on a head-on collision course. An act of war? They've been waiting for us for a thousand years, keeping the utmost distance imaginable. So such a scenario would be an act of unprovoked hostility from our side. Even from my current perspective, the panic I felt was completely justifiable. I wasn't at all worried about my own possible demise or that of my crew, but the potential of starting a war with a species we haven't even met. The predicament was made even harder by the constant sound of an impossible rain falling on the sides of the hull. I should have been used to it by then, however, its, it's irregular pattern and inexplicable origin made me feel very on edge. My mood was in a constant flux between anger, annoyance, and petrifying fear. I had to find a way to open those damned cryo chambers. I had to do it if it was the last thing I did. At that moment, a few hours before the deadline for our course correction, I was unhinged just enough to be ready for anything. Since, thankfully, I am not an idiot, the first chamber I tried my techniques with had one of the other mission specialists inside. He was an astronomer who loved playing the piano back on Earth and was genuinely a good guy. But he wasn't pivotal to the mission at this point. I couldn't risk accidentally killing the captain or the pilot for that matter. First, I tried smashing the chamber window open with a makeshift bat made from the metal in the captain's chair. An impossible thunder struck the ship the moment I took the bat to the chamber. Lucky for my friend inside, the glass was just thick enough to not break. Otherwise, it probably would have gone right through his skull. Secondly, after further reasoning with the AI proved completely ineffective, I tried frying the circuitry of the astronomer's cryo chamber, hoping that once it was out of power, it would start up the security protocols and wake him. It... it didn't. I had to watch him suffocate in his sleep. However, with no time to despair about his loss, I thought what... Maybe what needs to be done is to turn off the power in the entire cryo section of the horizon to, I don't know, activate the emergency waking procedures. Uh, the ship might have thought that only one of us was expendable, but the entire crew? I doubted that highly. I gave myself an hour to think about it more thoroughly. However, it wasn't exactly time I could afford but deciding the fate of 11 more people, or even 12 counting myself, it had to be examined. After I found the controls that regulated the influx of power to the section of the horizon holding the cryo chambers, I sat down and I did my damned best at being as clear-headed as possible. It was tough. What if I ended up killing the rest of them like the astronomer? Or what if there was always another way that I couldn't think of at the moment and, and I ended up completely disrupting their brain functions if they didn't die in the process? The cryo dreams are such a delicate ecosystem of technology and metaphysics that I wasn't sure if I should even attempt detaching the remaining crew from it. On the other hand, as wrong and terrible as switching the power off might have gone, we were still on a collision course with the extraplanetary object. 
How much worse could it possibly get? I wished I was still in cryo la la land. For a split second, I even considered it. At first, my idea was to simply return to my cryo chamber and perish with the rest, with no remorse as to the consequences of the collision with the alien vessel. The burden of the decision would have stopped being mine. It would have stopped the moment I would enter the cryo dream. Right? Yeah. Right. God, I affirmed it for myself, dubiously disregarding all kinds of ethical intricacies that surrounded such an option. However, as I kept thinking about it, about my situation for the past ten-ish days, a little nagging question appeared in my mind. What if I never left cryosleep? Would that not solve all of my mysteries? Would that not answer the most pressing question of why I was the only one to wake? A cryo nightmare. My dear AI compatriot couldn't or wouldn't do anything to help me. The only thing it could and would do was to keep informing me every 10 minutes of my impending doom. Should I not wake the pilot? I wanted to talk to it, to talk my decision out with it. Maybe I would even want to ask it if I were even awake. But what good would that do me? <laughs> Funny. As opposed to anthropomorphizing as I was, my mind still wanted to do just that in my hour of desperation and utter solitude. We didn't even give the onboard AI a name. Also, my doing. <laughs> I wanted to teach my crew what communicating with a non-human would be like so that they would be ready. Should we make some kind of contact with whatever it was we had imagined back then that piloted the alien vessel? With my hour for contemplation almost over, the AI informed me, Scans of the Orbs Cloud concluded. Huh, I had completely forgotten about those. And for a moment, I even stopped registering the pestering rain and thunder that continued hitting the hull of the horizon as a phantom echo of a world far behind me. I shouldn't have checked the readings. I should have stayed in my lane and focused on making my ultimate decision before it was made for me by sheer haste. <laughs> in retrospect, I couldn't have hoped to possibly understand the readings. I already killed our astronomer, so the only ones capable of even deciphering what our AI had gathered about the Oort Cloud were over 7 trillion kilometers away. The 48th hour to our approach <laughs> rather collision with the vessel was upon me finally. There was no more time for decisions. I acted on impulse and yanked the levers on the power controls for the cryo chambers. I gave it a few moments. The chambers lost power and went dark. Nothing else happened. No chamber door opened. No human face peered at me from inside the chambers. <sighs> I was utterly devastated and lost all willpower to even stand and check the cryo chambers. Suddenly, the alarms of the horizon began blaring. The AI was telling me to get into an escape pod and abandon ship. In a moment of sheer panic and self-preservation, I leaped up and ran toward the pods. For some reason, the rain and thunder had intensified to abnormal levels. The sound was so amplified that it was almost hurting my ears and gave me an instant migraine. It was louder than the alarms. When I finally approached the pods and saw all 13 of them laid out in the bay, it hit me. I would be leaving my colleagues, my crewmates, my, my friends in this terra incognita, in a state between life and death. I wasn't even sure if the emergency protocols kicked in and kept them inside the cryo chambers instead of reviving them. 
With no time and no ability to think straight anymore, I jumped inside the first escape pod and got ready to power it up. <laughs> However, I wasn't that lucky. There was no simple escape for me. Nothing would end up being simple for me on this mission. The moment I pressed the switch, all power in the horizon was cut off. The pod wasn't responding to my commands either. There was complete and utter darkness, filled with the dreadful sound of rain and thunder. After a few moments like that, I realized that my eyes were closed and that there was actual light around me. I opened my eyes and I found myself back in my cryo chamber. So it was all a cryo nightmare. Um, not quite. M maybe? I felt like my brain was displaced from my body. Like I wasn't myself. Like I wasn't in complete control of my faculties. Physical or intellectual. I'd read somewhere that long periods of time in a cryo chamber can make the person waking from cryo sleep feel that way. Uh... Suddenly, I realized that the hatch wasn't opening, as it had in my previous stint in cryosleep. However, as panic began to take over about being trapped inside a cryo chamber, I should have been more scared of what was out there. On some instinctive level that wasn't instantly registering in my conscious mind, my eyes must have begun scanning what was barely discernible from the window of the chamber. Then it struck the true horror, the biggest fear I could imagine, bigger than waking in a dysfunctional cryo chamber. I wasn't on the horizon anymore. Have I, have I been transported to another place? When? Where? For, for the time it took me to open the hatch before my air ran out, I was trying to understand where my cryo chamber had been moved. However, my question was truly answered the moment that it finally opened. The bright lights in the unrecognizable room were almost blinding, and all I could see was a tall figure looming over me. It did not look human, and when I took another glance at the design of the place I was in, I realized that it wasn't man-made. I had been transported to the alien vessel together with my cryo chamber. The question remained if the rest were transported as well. This sounded like the right question at the time, but it would prove to be the wrong question. The alien thing towering over my chamber had a humanoid figure. Its face seemed as if it was in perpetual anguish showcasing an experience of terror only a being from outside of our solar system can experience. There I was, anthropomorphizing again. <laughs> Furthermore, my human mind was interpreting its language and gestures as stress and panic. I kept falling in a cognitive loop that I distinctly told my crewmates some years ago when we started our mission not to fall into. Once we reached the vessel and possibly made contact, my gut, however, kept telling me the same thing. The alien was looking directly at me with its three massive white eyes that barely had pupils, while its lips were contorting in some indiscernible tongue. I think it seemed to be under the impression that if it kept speaking to me, I would somehow begin understanding it. I'm good at my job, but I'm not a wizard. I was half expecting it to begin raising its voice at me as if saying the things louder would make me understand them better. However, I couldn't shake the feeling that this strange creature was trying to tell me something awful, something that seemed to be horrifying it to the point of stupidity. I, I wasn't afraid of the creature, no. I was afraid of what it was desperately trying to tell me. After it finally grasped 
that I couldn't magically begin to understand its words. It grabbed me by the arm and yanked me out of the cryo chamber. The alien was taking me to another part of the ship, holding my arm so tightly that I could barely feel it anymore. After a few moments, I realized that blood was dripping from the place where it had grabbed. I looked at its hand holding mine and noticed that it had three talon-like fingers covered in fur, digging into my flesh and tearing my skin. Little blood droplets fell on the metal floor of the ship, like breadcrumbs leading the way to wherever it was taking me. I don't think it was aware it was hurting me, and I was too confused and dizzy from cryosleep to react. We passed corridor upon corridor from the massive ship without coming across any other creature like it. Has it been alone here all this time? Or was the vessel just so enormous that one could spend a lifetime without seeing another soul? The corridors were built with a single creature passing through them in mind. The ceiling was as high as the alien and as narrow as to only let its skinny figure pass through. I was being pulled behind it, just barely squeezing through the corridors, feeling a little claustrophobic and very nauseous still, and the alien wouldn't shut up. Suddenly we came upon a large room with even higher ceilings and cold air rushing through it. As we entered, I noticed the difference in air quality and my nausea began dissipating almost immediately. The moment we stepped inside, bright yellow lights came on in the room, which was as big as a horizon deck. Surely this must have been one of the smaller ones there? It was almost empty, though very similar to the one we left behind with my cryo chamber inside. Come to think of it, I didn't see any other chamber in that room. Nothing else was there that looked like human technology. It seemed as though only my cryo chamber was transported to the extraplanetary vessel. Then I noticed it, right in the center of this new room, where the alien had taken me so hastily, was another man-made cryo chamber. I pulled my arm out of the alien's grasp and ran toward the chamber. It, it was identical to my own. Coming closer and closer to it, I was happy that another one of my crew had survived. Assuming that our ship was wrecked upon collision with the alien vessel, there may be others in different rooms just like this one, I thought. Those were just fleeting moments of happiness, however. That ended the moment I arrived at the chamber and peered through its frozen window. The person sleeping inside of it, it was me. At first, I was completely unbelieving. I cleared the window from the ice with my bloodied hand and glued myself to it. It really was me. I was looking at myself in a chamber absolutely identical to my own. I took a step back and saw my name written on the side. Next to my name was the ticking clock of the chamber in Earth years. The year it was showing was... Huh, was 3531. I freaked out and began banging on the damned chamber... What the hell was happening? All of a sudden, I felt the alien grabbing me to stop me from destroying the chamber, and what seemed like an alarm began booming in the massive room. Bright, violent lights shined in and out, and the sound of heavy rain and thunder filled the room. My mind gave out, and I fell unconscious on the alien vessel, located at the very edge of our heliosphere. Mission Specialist Clark, log number 1094.65, Earth Year 2531. I have awakened from cryosleep mere hours ago. Oh, I'm very nauseous and can barely keep my eyes open. The horizon doesn't seem to be ready for me, or any of us, yet uh, the rest of the crew is in stasis. I expect them to be awake any moment now. Though the captain and pilot should have been awake long ago. Our approach toward the extraplanetary vessel that had emerged from the Oort cloud some thousand years ago is steady. We have about um, 13 days at current speed to reach its location. 
Horizon stats are nominal. Hey, Creepypasta fans. It's Teresa. Thanks for listening. To connect and support us, make sure to check out our Discord and Patreon links in the description. And remember, stay cosmic. <laughs>